Have you ever read a translation and thought, this sounds so natural, like it wasn't even translated? Or perhaps the opposite, this sounds a little awkward, you can definitely tell it was translated from another language. What you might be responding to is how much a translation could be perceived as either domesticating or foreignizing. A domesticating translation is one that closely conforms to the culture of the language of the translation, even if it means losing some of the nuanced style or cultural context of the source text. These types of translations often read as if they were written in the target language, and are so accessible that readers often forget they're actually reading something that has been translated. In contrast, a foreignizing translation is one which attempts to replicate the style, syntax, and cultural context of the source text, often using phrases and wording which are uncommon in the language of the translation. These types of translations often seem foreign to readers of the target language, who rarely forget they're reading something from a foreign language. This is a question to which every translator has to give some thought. Do I want my translation to sound foreign, reminding readers that they are reading a text that was originally written in a different language? Or do I want my translation to sound domestic, in our case American, as if it were written originally in English by an American author? These ideas were explored by 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Schleiermacher, who observed that translations tend to do one of two things, bring a foreign author to the language of the reader, or bring the reader to the language of a foreign author. What does this mean? Well, in the first example, where the foreign author is brought to the language of the reader, the author's work is being domesticated by the translation. A domesticating translation is usually easier to grasp. The reader can enjoy the work as if it had been written in the reader's own language. In the second example, where the reader is brought to the language of the author, the translation is foreignized. A foreignizing translation is often more difficult to read or sounds unidiomatic in the target language, and often the reader has to work harder to understand it. American translators who lean toward foreignizing their translations use various methods to make the text feel foreign and unfamiliar. One method is to bring in foreign words or sentence patterns from the language they are translating. Other methods are to use English words that are less familiar, old words, words no longer used, or to create colorful idioms that do not actually exist in English. All this to keep reminding the reader that what they are reading is not a text originally written in English. Translators who lean toward domesticating their translation work hard on making it sound as seamless and as American, in our case, as, and as contemporary as possible. The idea is to use natural, everyday American language. This is currently the preferred method in mainstream literary translation in the USA. These terms, foreignization and domestication, were popularized by translator and theorist Lawrence Venuti, who argued that no translation can provide direct or unmediated access to the source text. In other words, we shouldn't view translations as if they magically appeared out of thin air, perfectly conveying a source text. Rather, a translation is the result of a series of interpretive choices a translator has made. This may sound like an intuitive statement, but it's actually quite profound. Consider these two translations of the opening lines of Homer's ancient Greek epic, The Odyssey. The one on the left was composed by 19th century poet William Morris in 1874. The translation on the right was done by classicist Emily Wilson in 2017. Notice the differences between these two translations. We'll start with the Morris translation. Tell me, O oh muse, of the shifty, the man who wandered afar after the holy burg, Troy town he had wasted with war. He saw the towns of menfolk, and the mind of men did he learn. Next, we'll look at the Wilson translation. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went, and who he met. 
Notice how the translators chose to render the famous opening line, the ancient Greek phrase anthropos palitropos, or man of many ways, referring to the character Odysseus. Where Morris translates this phrase as the shifty, an unusual choice, Wilson chose the much more accessible, complicated man, using a common and easily understood phrase. The translators also opt for very different approaches for translating the last line of this excerpt. For instance, where Morris describes how Odysseus saw the towns of menfolk and the mind of men did he learn, Wilson offers the simpler where he went and who he met. If we had to choose, the Wilson translation would definitely be seen as the more domesticating translation, with the Morris translation being seen as the more foreignizing, even taking into account the gap of time between their composition dates. William Morris, in his translation of the Odyssey, uses various foreignization techniques. He does much to make his translation unfamiliar to us to remind us that it's an ancient text written in an ancient language. The man who wandered afar after the holy burg, Troy town, had been wasted with war. Well, afar is understood today, and we do sometimes hear it, but it's slightly archaic. We would generally say far or far away. Burg is a word that comes from Old English. Uh, it means castle or fortress. We generally don't use it today anymore, but we still hear it in names of towns such as uh, Pittsburgh or Newburgh. Troy town uh, for the city of Troy is also unfamiliar and archaic, as is the word menfolk, which we can understand. We know it means people, but it's not uh, a word that we generally use today. Now, if we look at Wilson's version, it's more natural. Uh, it uses modern language naturally, as you and I might. Tell me about a complicated man. Tell me how he wandered and was lost. So these are sentences that you might use yourself every day. Where he went, who he met. It's natural spoken English. Let's return to Venuti's statement that no translation can provide direct or unmediated access to the source text. Can we really just read one translation of the text and say, I've read Homer? Or should we really be saying, for instance, I've read Wilson's translation of Homer? The point is, what we're reading is the translator's choices. And one of the factors behind those choices is the translator's inclination towards domestication or foreignization. So how are these concepts useful for translators? For one, they can help you think about your translation process, something which you may have taken for granted. How and why do you make different choices in your translations? Do you tend to translate text in a way that's clear and legible, even if it sometimes means glossing over difficult passages that don't quite make sense in the target language? Or do you enjoy moments of foreignness and idiosyncrasy in a source text so much that you try to replicate them in your translation, even if it makes the translation difficult or awkward for readers? Another way these concepts are helpful is they force you to think about the question of audience. Who are you translating for? There's a difference between translating for an academic specialist and translating for, say, your roommate or grandparent. How useful is it for a translation to be foreignizing if it is, for instance, a children's book for young readers? What about poetry or song, where sound and meter are also important parts of the meaning? Of course, in practice, domesticating and foreignizing aren't mutually exclusive concepts. They're not political parties you have to register for or pledge loyalty to. Sometimes a translator will do both in the span of a single page, even sometimes a sentence. How a translator combines domestication and foreignization in their translation reveals their own personality and preferences, and also their personal approach for interpreting a text.